Okay, guys, welcome back to class. This is going to be lecture number seven in our series on the book of Acts. And I just want to say how gratifying it is uh, for someone like me. I just love the Bible. I love learning the Bible. I love the Jesus of whom the Bible speaks. And I sure love seeing that there are other people out there <laughs> that are interested in these things. It's like one of my greatest joys. And it's a tremendous encouragement that you guys came out on like the coldest night so far. It's warmed up. Oh, good. It's only minus 16. Tomorrow, tomorrow night is going to be a 52 below wind chill. Okay. Uh, We're having a heat wave. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we go to the Lord and uh, ask for some help tonight so that we can learn the things that he's pleased to teach us. Heavenly Father, uh, this uh, class just comes together now as one person approaching your beautiful throne of grace to praise and thank you for the good things we enjoy in this life. We confess to you, God, once again, and we know and believe in our hearts that we are not worthy of the least of your mercies, and yet we trust you at your word that you did not spare your only son, but delivered him up, delivered him up for us all. And it's a tremendous mystery, God, but we believe it. We thank you for the promise of um, a future inheritance of all things. Uh, Lord, tonight we ask you to minister to us by your Holy Spirit. We ask you to illuminate this text so that we can better understand our own family history, a history of the body and bride of Christ, the household of faith, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So we just want to commit our efforts here to you, God, and we pray that uh, tonight is enjoyable and helpful to everybody. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Okay, guys, well, we're in the book of Acts. You probably figured that out. We're in, we're in Acts chapter 2. I'm, I was hoping to get through 2 and maybe 3 tonight, but we'll see. We don't want to rush through, but we also don't want to get bogged down. Chapter 2, we see the fulfillment of Christ's great promise that he made in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew 16, during the Lord's earthly ministry... He did uh, promise that he would build his church. Remember that? He said, I will build my church. That was future to that time. And he got the project started in the book of Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. We saw that. Uh, he had his foundation in place. He had his apostles there. Apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. And he, he put the whole thing together there at Pentecost. And from that time to this very moment... He has been building upon that foundation and adding members into the body and bride of Christ. And we are those living members, aren't we? And um, that was a pretty spectacular thing that happened there. Now, you remember last week, uh, there were spectacular, a spectacular, uh, miraculous event happened. What was that? The people began to uh, prophesy. They began to uh, glorify God. And all the visitors to Jerusalem heard the praises of God in their own languages. That was, that was a miraculous supernatural event that happened there. And it authenticated the apostolic witness. And um, it showed that God, who, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, even now is still doing miraculous things on the earth. And this was supposed to signal the beginning of something new and spectacular, namely the church. Now, after the, all this happened and Peter gave his beautiful scriptural defense for what is happening... Uh, it says that the, the men, of, men of Israel who heard Peter, and there he is, there's Peter. <laughs> uh, it says that they were cut to the heart and they asked, they said, what must we do? And Peter's, Peter says here, look at 237, chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. That means change your mind. R literally, it means think again. Metanoia means think again. The implication is, now that you've thought, thought it over again, you've come to a very different conclusion, the opposite conclusion. So he says, change your mind here. Think again. Every one of you, it says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we went into that last week. We said, don't get confused. Don't misunderstand the text. When it says, um, repent and be baptized, 
uh, for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus, it doesn't mean you go get baptized and now your sins are forgiven, like as though the water could wash your sins away. We, we looked at that Greek preposition, ace, and we noted that in Matthew 12, it, in that context, it meant because of. Remember, the, the men of Nineveh, uh, they repented at ace, at the preaching of Jonah, which meant they repented because of Jonah's preaching. So in context here, and we have Greek scholarship to back us up on this, in the context here, Peter is saying, because you have received the remission of sins, therefore go get baptized. This comes very close in time, though, right? There's no 10 weeks of lessons or something. There's, you, they're going to talk to church leadership, and if they, if they are confessing the right things and they look sincere, they get baptized. And we're going to find out before we're done with the book of Acts that even though this was the normal method in the early church, it was not an infallible method. It, didn't, it did not keep the pretenders out. It may have been a screen to keep some of them out, but it didn't keep them all out. And some people got baptized, and they, never even, they weren't even believers. And we see that even in our own day. The point I want to make here is that, remember, you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. Baptism is a work. It doesn't save you. That's important to, to understand that. Okay? It's just applying water to a problem, namely you know, a sin problem, will do nothing to save us or to change our natures. That's the big problem. Do you remember in the days of Noah, there was a big problem on the earth. The earth was filled with violence. Every intent of the thoughts of, thoughts of the hearts of men were only evil continually, the Bible says. So what did God do? He flooded the world, a global deluge, 371 day long deluge, worldwide deluge. And guess, guess who survived? Eight people, the only righteous people on the earth, the only people in, you know, uh, in whose eyes uh, God's, God saw grace there. God had grace for them. Well, guess what? When the flood ended, guess what walked off the ark? Eight sin natures. The, the, the water didn't solve anything, really. In terms, of the, in, in terms of transforming the human heart, water won't do the trick. We should learn that by now, right? So now take a look here at verses um, 39 and 40. Peter says, um, go get baptized. And then he says, verse 39, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Uh, and here uh, you can kind of see um, a tension here between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. He says um, in verse 39, there's a promise being made. It's the same promise to everybody, uh, to you and to those who are afar off, as many as the Lord will call. God has to do the calling. He has to. Nobody comes to God on their, uh, because their own brilliance, unaided human brilliance, led them to the conclusion that the gospel is true and therefore they must seek Jesus. No one is brilliant enough to figure that out. No one would seek God. No one would come to God. No one could even understand the gospel uh, unless God enabled him to do that. God has to do the calling. But look at verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. You have some responsibility here too. He, God's sovereignty, human free will and responsibility. I do want to explore this a little bit here. Uh, it says, the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. Afar off, geographically, yes. We're going to see the gospel go all the way to Rome before we're done. And chronologically, you got it. It's also a promise to those who are afar off in time. That promise, it, it actually makes its way to us today. We're the one, we were afar off from those uh, early saints in the church age. And, um, but notice it says, um, to as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, I have two questions here. We want to look at these together. Question one is, does God only call some? And number two, are only some drawn to Jesus? So, that, I mean, that's a, this is a serious question here. Does God only call some people? You remember John six forty four. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draw him. Does he only draw a few? Uh, and does he only call a few? Well, I think the answer is no to both those questions. That's my, as I understand the scriptures here. In John, rather, Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, 
We have Paul's magnificent address to the Athenian philosophers. And at the end of that address, he says, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, if that's not worldwide, I don't know what is. That is worldwide language there. All men everywhere, God commands them to repent. Change your mind. Jesus said in John 12, 32, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And I think that God is calling and drawing everybody, everybody, the world. He wants the world to be saved. I take that, you know, passages like 2 Peter 3, 9, I take that to be at face value. The problem is, even though God is calling and drawing everyone, some, as uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39 will tell us, some draw back to perdition. Even the unsaved are drawn to Jesus to some extent, but it's up to them if they want to draw back to perdition or destruction. And and an object lesson here would be the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, Jesus was approached by a rich young ruler. That man was drawn to Jesus. He was called and drawn. Something about Jesus fascinated him, and he came and he sought Jesus, and he had interaction with Jesus, and the Lord taught him a hard lesson, and he drew back, as far as we know, to perdition. You see? But the man was called and drawn. And I think he did like Acts, or, um, Hebrews 10 uh, tells us. Uh, the point I want to make here is that I truly believe that God is absolutely sovereign over salvation. Uh, no saved person on this planet can claim autonomy here. Nobody can claim Um, that they came to Jesus on their own wisdom or strength. They were enabled to do that by God. They were called, they were drawn. Uh, And I think everybody is to some extent or other. Uh, The book of Romans is pretty clear. Chapters one and two, God has made his existence evident to everybody. He is clearly seen and understood. Uh, That's why people have no excuse, you see. God has revealed his presence and his moral law immediately. (coughs) There's no mediating agency between God has revealed it to the hearts and minds of everybody immediately. And, um, and I think at one point or other in your life, you'll be drawn to that, but you may choose to draw back to, to perdition. Um, some people are drawn to Jesus in a kind of magnetic fashion. They may have a, fa- a fascination with him. There are atheists, there are God-denying atheists who are absolutely fascinated with the person of Jesus, like Bart Ehrman, for example. The man took it upon himself to become fluent in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, and he probably has the old, uh, uh, I'll say the New Testament at least, he probably has the whole thing memorized. Yet he's an absolute atheist. Who's that? Uh, Bart Ehrman. Yeah. And others too. Absolutely. John Dominic Crossan and others. Fascinated with Jesus, but absolutely reject him for salvation. See? They are drawn to him, but... um, that's when it really counts, they're drawing back from the offer of salvation to perdition. Some are just curious, and some, we see even in the New Testament, some are, are uh, drawn to him, and they come forward. In terms of uh, salvation, they will draw back and be destroyed. But while they are still living life on this earth, they continue to press forward on their own strength to do what? To get as close to Jesus as they can to destroy him. You see that even today. You'll see uh, so-called scholars, biblical scholars, historians, philosophers, they'll get as close as they can to this Bible so that they can explode this thing from the inside. You see that a lot today. They're going to get as close as they can, get as educated as they can, so that they can intellectually dismantle our book for us and show us how, how fraudulent it really is. See? And we see that, too, going on in the world. But... um, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but the point is, uh, I do take it seriously that God isn't, he has assumed a saving posture to everybody, and he does call and draw everybody, and what we do with that is up to us. You're going to see in in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, uh, Stephen will, he will rebuke those religious leaders. He will say, why do you always resist the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit can be resisted. In the gospel of Luke, uh, Luke will say that the Pharisees, they rejected the will of God for their lives. It was God's purpose to save those people. They didn't want to be saved. And uh, so I take that uh, to be at face value there. Um, Let's take a look here at verse 41. It says, Then uh, those who gladly received his word, that's Peter's word, were baptized. 
And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. That's very significant, very significant, because in Jewish thinking, the Mosaic law was given at Sinai on Pentecost. That's the idea there, that the law came at Pentecost. And you know and I know, according to Exodus 32, when the law was given, there was a huge rebellion against God. At the time Moses was receiving the tablets, the people were down at the foot of the mountain doing what? Worshipping a golden calf. They hadn't even received the law yet, and they're already breaking it. And uh, Moses was so upset with the whole thing. It was, a, it was a whole tragic set of circumstances, but the, the long and short of it is the tribe of Levi stepped forward and executed th- about 3,000 men died that day. So at the giving of the Old Covenant, 3,000 people died. At the giving... Uh, we'll say near the dawn of the birth of the new covenant at the birth of the church uh, the the first recipients of the new covenant 3,000 souls saved added to the church can we put it that way so that you see a little parallelism a little significant um, parallel there we read and look at verse 42 and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. The apostles' doctrine, steadfastly continuing in the apostles' doctrine. This is paramount. Uh, This sounds like the instructions that um, Barnabas will give the Gentile believers in Acts 11. He will tell them, with purpose of heart, cling to Jesus. Continue with Jesus, he will tell them that. This is what the early church is doing. They're going to continue steadfastly. That takes, that's, this is commitment. We are sold out to this. We are going to be stubborn in this. We're going to be inflexible in this. Uncompromising. We are holding to the apostles' doctrine, and we're not going to warp it, twist it, ignore it, deny it, or anything else. We're going to hang on to this and believe it. Order our steps in accordance with the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in that doctrine, Now, the great apostle John will tell us in his first epistle, chapter 4 and verse 6, he will tell us that this is your test. This is is a test for authenticity here. Anyone who will not receive the apostle's teaching, you know that that's a heretic. You know that that is an unsaved person. He says, this is your litmus test here. And that's important. That that is so important. Um, This test will show you who is, uh, actually, John will say this. This will show you who is of God and who's not. The apostles' doctrine. So that makes us very, very interested in what the apostles were teaching, doesn't it? What is the message after all? And that drives us into the, into the New Testament. It's going to be... Remember Jesus said it in John 17? He said to his father, sanctify these believers. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is, this is what's going to put the division between us and the rest of the world, the apostolic doctrine, right? And, and that's not that fun, is it? I have loved ones too, so do you. They have heard the apostolic teaching and they have stepped over the line. They say, well, we're going to stay over here. We don't want to come and receive this teaching. And that's, and that's sad. But Jesus said, I come to bring division. You know, he says... It, uh, they of a man's house will be his enemies for now. The sword he brings is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and it will divide. It will divide homes, it will divide families, uh, nations even. Even the local church sometimes, we're going to see that yet. First Corinthians 11, Paul will say, there must be heresies among you, there must be factions, so that those who are approved may be made manifest. You know, at this point in church history, guys, The church is as pure as it ever will be, probably until the return of Jesus. That looks to be the picture. There are no unbelievers here yet. No pretenders. We have a pure church, okay? And and we're going to see that. Uh, They continued, it says in verse 42, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship and prayers. Uh, Unity, unity, major theme in the Bible. Paul just about beg the Corinthians, listen, please, don't let there be factions among you. Come on, do your best to think the same things, get on the same page. In some of his epistles, he, uh, there's one epistle where apparently the church he's writing to had some women who didn't like each other. And he said, encourage these two to get on the same page. 
<laughs> you know, we've got to. Be, there's a Satan out there that hates us. If we could peel back the curtain for just a minute and look and have a, have a good look at our enemy, the devil, how hideous he is, what his plans for us are, and he's got myriads of uh, fallen demonic entities at his disposal, and they all have one thing in mind, and that is to kill and steal and destroy. They want to rip our lives apart. And if we could see that for just a minute, boy, our little differences wouldn't amount to too much, would they? I don't think they would. But unity, unity, it, it, it really factors uh, in a major way in the New Testament. And look at this. Prayer is a priority to these people. They continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Steadfastly in prayer, too. And how important that is. You remember, Jesus taught us how to pray. And, and when he did, he didn't say, um, well, if you get around to praying, here's how you do it. <laughs> if you find the time... Here, here's how you would pray, you know, provided you actually get around to doing this. He never talked like that. He said, when you pray, and the assumption is that you're praying, you're, you're praying people, right? And if we're going to walk like Jesus walked, then we need to be in prayer. We need to be people of prayer. And uh, you remember in Matthew 6, that's where we get um, a blueprint for prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Not that he ever needed to pray like those things, but um, it was a blueprint for us. Jesus never had to ask forgiveness, right? But we do. But in the Lord's Prayer, and I think we probably all have it memorized, don't we? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And um, lead us not into temptation, which is under dispute now, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, you look at that prayer, that model prayer, there are really six petitions there. And I'm thinking the early church was probably petitioning God for these six things, and they would do it in their own words. They're not going to mindlessly chant prayers. <laughs> I'm sure they weren't, can I say this? I'm sure they weren't ticking through the prayer beads, thoughtlessly, mindlessly uttering words. Okay. I'm sure they were, uh, they were um, petitioning God for these six things. So if you're interested, here's the six petitions uh, of the Lord's Prayer as um, the Lord Jesus gave it to us. The first petition is for the glory of God, for God's glory. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. God's glory. That's, number, that's the first um, petition. We want to see God glorified. At the end of the prayer, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. We want to see God glorified. And, and it's a little ambiguous. We, we wonder, what does that mean to glorify something? What does that even mean? We have only a rough estimate of what it means. I think at its very basic, is, it would be to speak well of somebody. In God's, in God's case, I mean, we're going to speak in maximal terms. Excellent. Superlative terms. Yes. That we're gonna, you got it. Maximal excellence with God. He is second to none and all those great making properties and attributes, right? He is all powerful, most powerful, most high, uh, omnibenevolent, all loving, morally perfect, all those kinds of things. Uh, he's the one who loved us first. He, sh he showed forth his great love in spectacular, breathtaking fashion and things like that. We want the world to know that. So we want to glorify God. We want to see God glorified. The other thing we'll petition God for is for the kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Obviously, uh, the way God has ordered heaven right now is not an exact mirror of what's happening on earth right now. We say that God runs the world, and he sur surely does run the world. But I think it's an inescapable fact that um, people are also exercising their own self-determination and their own potential to do evil, that they are actualizing that. And that is not what's happening in heaven amongst angels. That is not happening there at all. And um, so we, we want, we pray for the kingdom to come so that Jesus is reigning and ruling on planet earth and all things that offend are not here anymore. <laughs> we don't even want the presence of sin in our world, right? And so we pray for the kingdom to come. We also pray that God's will be done. That's closely related, isn't it? It's God's will to bring the kingdom and yet apparently it's not coming if we don't pray for it. You've got that one figured out? I don't. 
You need to pray. You, you know, remember uh, James's epistle? You have not because you ask not, he said. And when Jesus was asked, how do we pray? Teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray. Right there, we have an answer to prayer when Jesus gives the instructions. You'd figure if you're a good teacher, you'd be teaching these guys how to pray, but apparently he wasn't going to do it until they asked. And the whole interaction here is a wonderful object lesson concerning prayer. You don't get if you don't ask. And yet it's God's will to give you what you're asking for. In, in this case, we're asking for something huge. It's called the kingdom. It's coming. God's word said it's coming, but it won't come if you don't ask. Got that figured? Mm-hmm. It's sort of like in Acts 27. And that ship was going to sink, but Paul got a message from God. Don't worry, everybody's going to be saved. No one's going to be lost. Oh, next instruction. Everybody, you've got to stay together or, you, or, some, or you, we're going to die. See? You've got some responsibility. If you, don't th- if you don't do this, we're all dead. But guess what? We're all going to be saved. That, that is the mysterious interaction between God's sovereignty and human free will and responsibility. We do pray, though, I mean, to get back to our petitions, God's will be done on this planet. It's what we want. We are also to pray for our needs. The early church would have been praying, uh, give us this day our daily bread. You pray for your needs, your felt needs. Uh, That is a confession to God. And anyone around you, these people are gathering for corporate prayer. Our prayers are a reminder to ourselves and to others that we are needy people. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And we believe him. And I'm big and you know me, I love philosophy. I love to think deep as I can. If feeble, but I try. And I'm fascinated with, with this truth that unless God will, could enable us, unless God would enable us to do it, we wouldn't even be able to calculate one plus one equals two. That, that you don't figure that by yourself. A is A. Don't need God's help for that. Oh, yes, you do. And if we want it to go down deep and stay down long and come up dry philosophically, I could argue those things. We need Him, even for the things we consider to be mundane. So we would petition God to meet our needs. And um, somewhere in our prayers, there really must be a confession of our sins. And, and um, we would ask God to forgive us our sins. Remember uh, 1 John chapter 1. Paul, uh, John, rather, John has some strong words, doesn't he? He said, anyone who says he's without sin deceives himself. You say you're without sin, you deceived yourself. The truth is not in you, says John, he says, in fact, you make God a liar when you talk like that. And he says, but I write these things to you so that you don't sin. Right? First John chapter 2. I write these things so that you don't sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So we sin and we need to tell God about it. We need to ask forgiveness and get that cleansing and... Um, and get functioning again, get walking with God again, get that fellowship restored, right? That's important. Is it, I mean, does this sound like our prayers? Our prayers often, I'll confess it, my prayers often include thank you to God for things that we enjoy, and then a whole list of things we want, and where's the confession for my sins? I praise God that, that Jesus Christ the righteous is there right now interceding for me because I'm too dull to even recognize or think about my own sin and the need for um, forgiveness. My own need, I I don't even think to ask forgiveness. And yet, I cannot say that every thought has been perfect. I think about a million thoughts a day. Have they all been perfect? Were they the best thoughts I should have had for the moment? No, I don't think so. That means I probably sinned about a million times a day. Thank you that the to God, that the blood of Christ is sufficient to cover all this. I mean, this is amazing, isn't it? Let's look at that over there. (laughs) All right. And um, petition number six would be the pursuit of holiness. That we'd want to petition God to help us to pursue holiness. You know, lead us not into temptation. To deliver us from from evil or from the evil one. We would want to walk a walk that is worthy of the high call he's put on our lives. I mean, that's what we're shooting for. So there, that would be our six petitions as given to us um, by Jesus in what we call the Lord's Prayer. We're asking for God's glory, God's kingdom, uh, God's will to be done, our felt needs, 
a confession of sin and uh, the need for uh, forgiveness. And finally, God help us in our pursuit of holiness and put it in our hearts to even desire a holiness. Okay. And so that, um, this will bring us now to Acts 2.43. Look at uh, verse 43. It says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Remember, this is at the dawn of the church age. And uh, we want to say this is really the foundational stage of the church. The foundation has just been laid. The church has just been sort of uh, brought into the world. And um, signs and wonders attended Christ's earthly ministry, authenticating the word. Remember, Jesus said uh, in John 4, he, he said to that man who was... Um, uh, coming to Jesus, he said, heal my son. He, he, my son is in desperate need. Jesus said, unless you see signs and wonders, you will by, you by no means believe. Right? And I mean, you take that for what it means. I mean, Jesus said, there's nothing going to convince you people, some of you, unless you see signs and wonders. What did Jesus do for that man that he said those things to? He healed his son. Yeah. Guess what? The man and his whole household got saved. Right? Now, signs and wonders won't convince everybody. In fact, it may just harden their hearts, like Pharaoh. The more signs and wonders that are done, the more truth is rejected, the, heart, the harder the heart becomes. But for some people, they could see a sign or, or a wonder. And for them, the apostolic witness was authenticated, and there was true repentance and salvation, okay? But it does seem to me to be the case that we don't necessarily need to be expecting signs and wonders and miracles right here, right now. We don't need to expect that. I think God can do it. I am not cessationist. Guys, God can do whatever he wants. If he wants to do a miraculous thing, he can. Uh, I am not opposed to that. I won't stand in the way of that. But let's, let's face it. Paul was performing miraculous healings. Paul was even raising the dead. Peter was too. But by the time the book of Acts is drawing to a close... By the time the first century is drawing to a close, you know, Paul could say, I've left um, Trophimus sick in Miletus. Why didn't you heal him, Paul? Apparently, it was not God's will to do that. He said, Timothy, I want you to drink a little wine for your frequent illnesses, for your stomach's sake. Drink some uh, water that's got some, some alcohol in it that kills the, the bad stuff. I think that's the idea there. Right, A little wine for your stomach's sake. Why didn't you just heal Timothy, Paul? Timothy was your favorite disciple. He was like-minded. He was a man of faith. Yet he had to persist with frequent illnesses. I'm simply saying, <laughs> I, hope, I think you understand what I'm saying. God can do signs, wonders, miracles. He can do miraculous healings. He can raise the dead. I think even now he could do it. But the fact that you may never see such things in your lifetime does not mean the Bible's inauthentic. Right? No one's gonna, you're not gonna abandon your faith because you've never seen somebody ra raised from the dead, right? I prayed, Melinda and I prayed fervently for our young son. It pleased the Lord to take him from the earth. He's in heaven with Jesus now. You think that just decimated my faith? No. No, not at all. So, you got that. That's, that's clear, right? All right. So, I went over three minutes, but are there any questions quickly before we take our break here? Any questions or comments about anything we looked at there so far? Okay, well, well, let's take 10 minutes. When we come back, we're going to finish up with Acts 2. And if we can, I'd like to read the 26 verses of Acts uh, 3. And we might actually get through the chapter. And it's a remarkable chapter there, okay? So let's take our break, 10 minutes, and we'll come on back, okay? Okay.